Radio Algeria International presents International Policy Code, a weekly program hosted by Lester Mazzari. The Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela's economy is estimated to have shrank by 4% in 2014, with inflation hitting 64%. The price of oil, which accounts for more than 95% of Venezuela's hard currency, continues to fall. However, this country of 30 million inhabitants has the largest oil reserves and the eighth largest natural gas reserves in the world and consistently ranks among the top 10 world crude oil producers. Our guest in our program is Professor Peter Sievales, Interim Chair at the Department of Politics and International Affairs at Wake Forest University in the United States. Professor Sievales, welcome to our program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Standing in line for hours to buy basic goods has become an exhausting reality of everyday life in Venezuela. Why are the causes of the crisis affecting now Venezuela? I think there's multiple causes, um, and we can look at both the political and economic side of the equation. The first part to understand what is important is the, the, the basic economics of what's going on in Venezuela right now. And you went over the uh, basic statistics of inflation rate, the uh, economy shrinking. So at the basic level of um, the basic contextual level of the economy, um, this profound crisis, you know, uh, that's been manifested by long lines, by shortages and all the rest, uh, comes from just a basic lack of economic growth and the dramatic decline in oil prices. Mm-hmm. But it also has some other sources as well. As you noted, 95% of the income comes from oil prices, and there's been a downward spiral in the prices of oil recently. Mm-hmm. Also, um, mismanagement and lack of investment at, at PDVSA, the Venezuelan oil company. If we look at also the, these sorts of economic patterns in Latin America, we can see that often there's just a downward spiral. So uncertainty breeds uncertainty. Inflation breeds inflation, and it's often hard to get out of these sort of cyclical trends that we see of a downward spiral of the economy. Also, Mm -hmm. in economic terms, part of it comes from uh, Venezuela's exchange rate policy. Um, They rely on three different tiers of exchange rates, and this has had a number of consequences. It's led to the development of an extensive black market for goods and the drying up of supplies. And also, Mm -hmm. rather than importing goods that are expensive, it gives importers an incentive to hoard cheap dollars rather than to spend them on importing goods. Mm -hmm. Uh, Finally, if we add to that price controls, uh, even if people do buy things to import at the more expensive exchange rate, there's price controls that prevent them from actually charging what these products are worth. So mm-hmm. what we face is really a prospect of a further devalued bolivar, the currency, mm-hmm. and, and it could, in the worst of circumstances, lead to hyperinflation. On the political side, we can see the crisis unfolding, I would say, mostly because Maduro is not Chavez, and he really can't rally mm-hmm. support in the same way that Chavez was able to. He doesn't have the following. He doesn't have the loyalty. He doesn't have the charisma. Mm-hmm. And even some of uh, Chavez's former supporters are dis- dis- distancing themselves from the government because of the violence, instability, and uh, food shortages. Well, Professor, President Nicolas Maduro blamed the crisis on a conspiracy of international bankers. What's your comment about that? Um, I think this is a classic response to an economic crisis. We see this um, in, in all political systems around the world, not just in Latin America. When you enter tough times, you always want to blame someone from the outside. And, you know, I think really the, the sorts of economic data that I went through before show that the source of this crisis is the basic reality, the basic economic reality that Venezuela faces. And I don't think mm-hmm. bankers did much to cause this problem. Mm-hmm. We also can see this kind of reaction in Maduro's effort to expand his power. Every time he makes reference to an outside influence, it's usually followed by an expansion of power or a request for additional decree powers. Really, in the end, when we look at the basic economic reality faced by Venezuelans, the minimum wage is three times what it was just back in 2012. But this increase in the minimum wage could not keep up with the slumping value of the Bolivar. So right now, the minimum wage has gone from 360 a month, $360 a month in 2012, all the way down to $31 a month today. So uh, I don't think international bankers have much to do with this I think it is, again, the basic economic reality faced by Venezuela and its insertion in the international economy. Do you think Venezuela's financial crisis is a clear warning to other countries which have placed so much of their stability on a single product? 
Yes, I, mean, I think this is absolutely the lesson. Just if we look across the region, we can see that Venezuela never took advantage of its economic bonanza mm-hmm. to diversify its products and production the way that we, we can say that Chile or Colombia have done. Exactly. Uh, this left it totally dependent on oil. But this mm-hmm. is also something that's common among oil-producing countries. It boils down to what political scientists have called the resource curse. That is to say, you know, you feel like you're blessed with this very valuable resource, be it petroleum, copper, silver, whatever it is. Yes. But what it does is it leads to a lack of competitiveness in other economic sectors, often to exchange rate appreciation. And others have pointed the idea that, you know, when leaders are tied to the population for tax revenues, that they're, they're more responsive and then in this way leads to more economic dynamism and better economic growth. A lot of oil analysts say that Venezuela has to sell oil at a minimum of $85 per barrel uh, to have an, even have enough money to pay the interest on its huge debt. So in this sense, um, I think this financial crisis is, as you say, a clear warning to other countries that if all of your economic eggs are put in one basket and one product, that it's likely to cause yeah. economic difficulties. Well, Nicolas Maduro, on January 4th of this year, uh, was on a tour involving China, Russia, several OPEC nations, including Algeria. What's your comment about that, Professor? Um, I think what that effort was, as Maduro often does, I mean, he has a couple of responses to uh, domestic pressure uh, within mm-hmm. his own country. And the first is to obviously blame the United States, uh, talk about U.S. imperialism. And, and in this sense, this does really help rally his core supporters. The other way is to promote Venezuela's international image abroad, which he's done with the ALBA Alliance, and also through this visit that he made to other oil-producing countries. This was really an effort, I think, to put pressure on especially Saudi Arabia and other OPEC countries to raise oil prices by reducing the supply. But I, we can see that international oil markets show that this, these efforts have obviously failed and prices have gone nowhere except for down. What will be the political repercussions on Venezuela? Maduro is in a very, very difficult situation. Mm-hmm. His approval rating in January stood at about 22%, and that's the lowest since the revolution started um, by Hugo Chavez in 1999, the lowest that the president mm-hmm. has reached. There's parliamentary exactly. elections in September, and uh, going into these elections, it seems as though uh, the ruling Socialist Party will be at a huge, huge disadvantage and is likely to lose. Again, we can see that what the political implications have been is that Maduro is attempting to rally support, and he's done this by pointing again to U.S. imperialism. And in this sense, the recent sanctions by the Obama administration against Venezuela, in my view, are likely to backfire, both domestically and internationally, because I think it will increase domestic support for Maduro and stop the decline in international support that was beginning to be perceptible um, in, in recent months. We also can see that uh, it's pushing the Maduro administration into some desperation. There's been the arrest of prominent opposition leaders like uh, Leopoldo Lopez and mayors uh, Daniel Ceballos and uh, Antonio Ledesma in Caracas and San Cristobal, respectively. Mm-hmm. And I think this is definitely a sign of uh, some sort of desperation on the part of the Maduro government. Mm -hmm. Well, now Maduro uh, faces the tough political challenge of keeping his job until the end of his current term in 2019. Do you see any military coup? Um, I think that I wouldn't go as far as to say that a military coup is likely. I wouldn't Mm -hmm. rule it out. I'd put the possibility maybe um, at 30%. Mm -hmm. I think if we look ahead, the... Mm -hmm political crisis is not going to be resolved until the economic crisis is exactly. resolved. Because Venezuela has been rocked by demonstrations um, against not just the deteriorating economy and food shortages, but also against rampant crime. And we've seen that you know, 43 people died in, in these protests late last year. So there's a couple of scenarios that analysts have you know, put forth as perhaps being likely for Maduro to follow. Um, one, he could do a sort of kind of reform process like Deng Xiaoping did in China, uh, kind of mm-hmm. consolidate a technocratic government, government liberalize the economy, all in the name of forwarding the revolution. And if we look at this scenario, it could strengthen the economy 
through more market-friendly reforms, and uh, many financial stakeholders would uh, maybe improve their position in Venezuela. I don't see this happening, though, because Maduro really is doubling down on his discourse of there being an economic war raged against, you know, being waged at, at, at Venezuela from the United States. And I don't think there's the wherewithal for any kind of significant market reforms. Um, on the other side, another scenario that a lot of people on the left are seeing is that mm. Maduro could move to kind of uh, try and stem corruption among his own supporters, and he could hold inefficient state sectors responsible and try and revitalize the revolution from the left. But I think there's some kind. Of, there's many obstacles to this sort of policy. Um, military power is growing, um, and it seems that because of it, are we unlikely to see any kind of significant move towards trying to root out corruption in the military? Also, the highly unfavorable economic conditions that Maduro faces right now make it unlikely that these kinds of reforms could take place beyond any sort of uh, just exchange rate policy reform. Could the recent U.S.-Cuba rapprochement affect Venezuela politically and economically? Yeah, this is a really uh, very, very interesting sort of triangular relationship and mm. uh, puts really Cuba into a difficult position of I would call triangular di diplomacy. First, uh, Cuba is going to continue to support Venezuela, but it's also going to be working to improve relations with Washington. Mm -hmm. So I actually think the U.S.-Cuba rapprochement is going to have more effect on Cuba than Venezuela, because Cuba really relied on oil revenues from Venezuela, and those are going to be driving up, drying up right now. So really this provides mm -hmm. more, ironically, more of a rationale for Cuba to try and improve relations with the United States. Mm -hmm. So I think for the short term, this is very complicated for Cuba, because it has to simultaneously work to improve relations with the United States. Uh, and also continue to support Venezuela. Mm -hmm. But in the long term, it may actually help improve U.S.-Cuban relations because it gives Cuba an incentive to improve them. Mm -hmm. Also, Raul Castro doesn't have the kind of close relationship with Maduro as he did with Chavez. So that personal element of the relationship between Venezuela and Cuba has been transformed. Do you see an end to Venezuela's economic crisis? Well, again, I think the only, uh, again, you know, I'm... I'm I'm firmly committed to the idea that politics and economics are related. And ironically, the end to the economic crisis will only come with the end to the political crisis, but it's very difficult to engage in economic reforms when there's such a deep political crisis in the country. As I said before, these things tend to be in a downward spiral. They tend to be difficult to stop. And every time I look at Venezuela, I think that it's bottoming out, but it just seems to get worse and worse as the days go on. Well, Professor, a last question. What will be the challenges for President Nicolas Maduro? I think uh, looking forward, the major challenge is, is going to be to stop this free fall in the economy. That's mm -hmm. going to be very, very difficult unless oil prices return to a, a level that is profitable for Venezuela. But again, at you know, running around $40, $45 uh, dollars a barrel, as we said, this comes nowhere close to even being able to allow Venezuela to service its debts. It continues to be, the country continues to be by, rocked by demonstrations. Um, and I do think that th these are going to be very, very difficult to stop. In this sense, I can return to the scenarios that I talked about before. Uh, mm -hmm. The challenge is going to be for Maduro to choose one of these reform routes, either the one that goes into more of a liberalization of the economy under the banner of the Bolivarian Revolution mm -hmm. uh, to really enhance Venezuela's economic situation, or one where he digs in more um, with more leftist rhetoric uh, to try and shore up support for the, um, for the revolution. Mm -hmm. I would not rule out the possibility of some sort of um, autogolpe, self-coup, of the type that we saw in Peru under Fujimori in order for Maduro to be able to put off elections mm -hmm. in the future, because this could be one of the only routes out of the current situation, but one that would be really unfortunate for democracy in the region. Well, Peter Siavelis, Interim Chair, Department of Politics and International Affairs at Wake Forest University, thank you for being with us. It was a pleasure. I enjoyed thank it. You thank much. you.